On August 27, 1939, Ernst Heinkel called Ernst Udet and told him the world's first jet plane has made its first flight, the HE-178. A few days later, Germany invaded Poland, and the significance of this flight was somewhat put on the back burner. And the successes of the Luftwaffe, both over the skies of Poland and later Scandinavia and France, lent no particular urgency to the development of this technology. But Heinkel went ahead with the twin jet engine fighter, the HE-280, which flew for the first time on March 20th, 1941. By now, the British Frank Whittle was on the heels of the Germans, and his first jet flew over England in May 1941, the Gloucester Meteor, E-28-39. But also Heinkel's rival, Messerschmitt, was working on a jet fighter similar to the HE-280, the ME-262, first proposed by the Air Ministry in 1938, fitted with a BMW P-3302 gas turbine engine. The prototype with a tailwheel, swept back wings, and designed as a fighter interceptor, even though the Luftwaffe had not yet designated such a role for it. The prototype flew on April 18, 1941. Now, we have all heard of the delays in production to come as Hitler was set on designating the jet as a fighter bomber capable of carrying bombs. Something that would require a lot of structural changes to redistribute the weight. Also, a significant change was that the tailwheel was moved forward as the pilots had no frontal vision while taxiing. But the real delay was the engines. The BMW had claimed its P3302 would produce 1,300 pounds of thrust. However, by late 1940, they only produced 570. Heinkel had meanwhile developed an engine capable of 1,100, and the new BMW P3302 engines did not arrive until March 25, 1942, and both of them failed on their first flight. By then, Junkers Juno engines produced 2,200 pounds of thrust, and these were installed in the third ME262 prototype and flew successfully on July 18, 1942. However, engine problems and maintenance needs following the plane throughout its history, especially when the manufacturers had a lack of chromium and nickel. This was needed for the steel alloys the planes needed in order to operate at high temperatures and substitutes were used, causing the engine to need overhauls after 10 hours of flight and outright replacement after 25. The Heinkel was faster with a better climb and a higher service ceiling, but its range was less than the ME262, and eventually, as we know, Messerschmitt got the contract 
after some political wrangling and lobbying. The first time fighter ace Adolf Gallant saw and had a chance to fly the jet was on May 22, 1942. Until then it had been so secret even he had heard nothing of it. He was impressed. So much so he proposed the cancellation of the ME-109 and instead replaced it with the ME-262 to go straight into production. And the first hundred airplanes went to a special unit to work out the testing and teething problems However, in the time since, many people have questioned the logic behind Hitler's wish for a capability of the ME-262 as a fighter-bomber. But after the Allied invasion of Sicily, it was clear that an invasion of France was coming. And when both Hitler and Goering, independently of one another, asked Willy Messerschmitt if the ME-262 could be adapted as a fighter-bomber, they were both told by Willy that the plane was from the outset planned to be fitted with two 250 kilogram bombs or one 500 kilogram bomb. However, this was not exactly true, and it's not entirely certain why he would make this claim at this time, except for fear of losing face. However, this then caused further consternation, as Milch in May 1943 told the Führer that none had been produced as a fighter bomber and only 16 had been delivered to the Erprobungskommando 262 in Bavaria. Only now did Hitler then learn that he had been misinformed, and that a significant design modification was necessary, and it still was not clear if the plane was able to carry even one 500 kilogram bomb. Upon discovering him having been deceived, Hitler set into Udet blamed him and ordered the ME-262 only to be produced as a fighter-bomber, whereafter he stripped Milch of his authority slowly and put the program under Göring, which eventually put it onto Kamla. But he did allow fighter testing to continue. And even if Göring did not want to outright have it out with Hitler, he must have known, being a forum fighter pilot himself, the potential of the ME-262. Now, on July 19, 1944, the first ME-292s arrived in France. The very first plane shot down by an ME-262 was a Mosquito on a reconnaissance mission with four more Allied reconnaissance planes to follow, all on July 26, and all by the same ME-262 flown by Alfred Schreib in quick succession. This clearly showed how the ME-262 could dominate the skies, especially if flown in numbers. But the engines and the design and production delays and the lack of early priority had effectively slowed down the planes delivered to the frontline service by several years. And with that delay, it possibly caused a significant delay to the end of the war. By August, the Allies were beginning to seriously worry about the ME-262. The plane was later also outfitted with four MK-108 slow-velocity 30mm cannons or one large 50mm MK cannon. Some were also fitted with rockets. Eventually, the jet production program as well as the development of the rockets had come under SS General Hans Kamla, and production would continue to increase towards the end of the war. Messerschmitt also produced a two-seater trainer, and some were fitted with radars and aces like Kurt Welzer would have over 20 confirmed kills in his ME-262 alone. In fact, most losses of ME-262s were during takeoff or landing, some lost to ground strafing or accidents, very few were actually lost in one-on-one -on -one air air-to-air combat. Gallant received his own ME-262 squadron, and this we will later hear ghost whispers of all the way up into the Korean War, explanation later. At least 735 Allied planes were claimed by the 262, but it was still too little and too late. So what did happen to the ME-262s and its design after the war? This was not the end of the design concept of ME-262, nor was it the end for the men who flew them. The Allied pilots who flew the ME-262 after the war would cite it as the finest jet at the time. 
The MA262 was found to be faster than the British Gloucester Meteor and had a better visibility and was found to be a better gun platform as well. The US Air Force compared the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star and the MA262 and concluded too that the MA262 was superior in acceleration and speed with a similar climb and performance. The ME-262 appeared to have a higher critical mark number than any American fighter. So why did this design not evolve and survive after the war? Well, some of them actually did, such as this Czech Avia S-92. At the end of the Second World War, many of the production facilities were located in Czechoslovakia for the ME-262. Thus, many of the jigs, tools and components for the 262 were there at the time of the German surrender. These were seized by the Soviet forces and then handed over to the newly restored Czech government by Marshal Konev. Forward fuselages and other components of the ME-262 had been manufactured at Letny. Some components had been produced in converted railway tunnels and the CKD and Walter Works had built the Junkers Juno 004 turbojet engine. Assembly of the fighters had been ta undertaken at Cheb near the German border. So sufficient components were recovered for the Czech aircraft company Avia to build at least seven single and two-seater ME-262s. The first single-seater flying as the S-92.1 on 27 August 1946. On September 5, this aircraft was lost in an accident, and its second S-92-2 flying on 24 October and what was referred to as the first series aircraft. A two-seater CS-92-3 following on 10 December, dubbed the Turbina. The S-92 was demonstrated the Yugoslav delegation was placed in order of the Avia for two examples. Although in the event these were not delivered, the seventh aircraft, CS-92-7, was experimentally fitted with a BMW-003 turbojet the thrust of which had boosted up to 950 kilograms. But flight testing was not entirely successful, and the engine was re-engined to take the standard Juno 004 turbojets. The 11th and 12th aircraft were completed during 1949 and during the summer of 1950. The 5th fighter squadron was formed on the Turbinas, but a year later this unit was disbanded. The Czech ME-262 was retired officially in 1951, but also some had been sent down to the Israeli Air Force for flight testing, where one unofficially crashed during these tests. And the ME-262's legacy did continue, in the form of the Sukhoi Su-09, and some design aspects of the F-86 Sabre and the MiG-15 came from the ME-262. Also, several modern reproductions have been built in latter years using GEJ-85 engines, and these still fly today. Also, the Czech have given the many World War II German factories were placed there flew several other German wartime production planes for a while. Some of these are now on display at the Aviation Museum outside Prague, definitely worth a visit, but don't expect anyone to be able to translate your questions. And as the war ended, several German piston engine jet fighters were also captured on the soil of Czechoslovakia and pressed into service after the war, most of them as trainers, both for ground support and outright pilot training. Some of these are also on display here. And of course, it should be appropriately enough, the plane that eventually replaced the ME-262 is also here, the MiG. The ME-262 legacy will still place it as a key part of aviation history, and aesthetically it is one of the most beautiful planes, and it will always stand out in history. One thing I did find interesting about the Avia sitting here is that at the museum they painted it in the German colors, or at least sort of, although this was a fully Czech-built, manufactured and flown version of the ME-262 and should have had the Czech markings. But what was that of the German pilot jet pioneers? The tech was dispersed for testing by the major powers, fine. 
but some of them, including the fighter aces, such as Adolf Galland, have a hole in their resumes just around the Korean War, and some have these similar gaps around the Vietnam War time. And one interesting radio intercept during the air war over Korea recorded an interesting transmission from a Russian MiG to another as these were jumped by U.S. planes. Achtung Seba. Not exactly something one would expect to hear from a Korean or Russian pilot. It seems that some of the German pilots were secretly flying Russian planes. It's never officially been acknowledged or admitted to. But if you're a fighter ace and there's a gig, well, you take it, don't you? And the funniest thing, just as I finished that sentence, my friend, Director John Milius, sent me a message because he knew Gallant, and he said that he flew 86A Sabres and F-104s in Korea. Go figure, more to that story. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebnuss Nuclear Reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.